Stay clear of the brow of the road tracks. We'll go ahead and light off the brow thruster. The Weatherbird 2 is on the second leg of a two-week cruise. At 115 feet, it's one of the better equipped research vessels working the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Its current mission is to collect and analyze fish and soil samples near the site of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And that'll be up in the site DSH-10, which is at a depth of 1,500 meters. Dave Hollander and Steve Morawski are leading a team of oceanographers from the University of South Florida. Valley, which is a very important area. Working closely with the ship's captain, Brendan Baumeister, they've spent weeks developing their itinerary. We're really interested in the fish uh, all along the uh, area north of the Deepwater Horizon because... Because time aboard the Weatherbird is limited and expensive, their plan is to divide into two teams and work around the clock. Okay, well that'll put us in a few hours behind, so it looks like we'll probably arrive to the first fishing site like mid-afternoon tomorrow, All right. which will give you time to do... Running we'll behind schedule and with the clock ticking, the team is facing one other time-related problem. Though the spill happened six years ago, Gulf Coast communities are still pressing scientists for more information, more answers about the environmental impact of Deepwater Horizon. The Weatherbird motored through the night, putting the research team back on schedule. Traditionally, every scientific cruise is given a nickname. This one is called the Mud and Blood Cruise. Steve Morawski's team is getting ready to catch fish. Though working in the field is never easy, August can be particularly brutal. It's 8 a.m. and the temperature is already approaching 100 degrees Fahrenheit it will be a very long day. What you're seeing is a long line fishing operation. Uh, we're setting out five miles of baited hooks. There's 500 hooks on that set. Their equipment is similar to what the commercial fishing fleet uses, except for one key difference. At the beginning and end of each of the long line sets, so you put this recorder on. And what it is is a temperature and pressure recorder. This is the recorder itself. You can see it's quite small. It also has a clock in it. So it tells us exactly when we set it out and when we retrieved it. To help with long lining, Tia Clark and Jorge Hernandez join the crew. When not working aboard the Weatherbird, they are, in fact, commercial fishermen. We're trying to catch a representative sample of the fish community in this particular location off Southwest Pass, uh, Louisiana, but we fished uh, all over the Gulf. We fished almost 200 different locations. The team's ultimate goal is to track the recovery and health of fish. This is a very confusing place because if you look around us, there's a tremendous number of oil facilities. The numbers are staggering. 4,000 gas and oil platforms. 25,000 miles of active pipelines, and 22,000 natural oil seeps, all contributing to an oil-soaked underwater environment. And so we're trying to basically disentangle the Deepwater Horizon effect from all the other background. And so that's why continued studies of this is so important. For some, this is a rare moment of downtime, until the lines are ready to be pulled in. That's when the field work really begins but only if there are fish on the other end of the line. The team will know in about two hours. Here we go. So generally we'll catch about 50 or so uh, on a 500 hook string, so nine out of 10 should be uh, empty. Uh, you can see that there's no bait left. That's a good sign. That means the fish are at it. Oh, red snapper. Come on, Chris, you can get him, you can get him. All right. Oh, a double. Oh, that's a nice one. It doesn't take long before the deck of the Weatherbird 
is covered with red snapper. From the animals that you see coming up, we're taking about a dozen different tissues, body parts. They include things like the inner ear stones of the red snapper so we can determine their age. We're taking liver samples, bile samples, muscle samples, and in some cases, spleen, liver, heart, and brain. Double, 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 double. 48. Susan Snyder is a graduate student at the University of South Florida. I work with the bottom drawing fish that we're catching here looking at their present day exposure to oil and any long-term accumulation in their tissues. We take the bile uh, to look at any exposure within the past couple days to oil compounds, and then we take other tissues like muscle and liver to get the long-term accumulation of oil in the tissues. We know we're killing animals, but the point is, in order to do these kinds of studies, we have to do this. There's no other way to do this with photographics or anything. This, this, is, this is basically fishery science. This is a male. Amy Wallace is a PhD candidate, also at the University of South Florida. To study fish at, around the time of the oil spill, you need to be able to tell what they're eating, were they in the area of the oil spill at the time of the oil spill, and if so, how did they change and move after that? I'm taking mussel and eye lenses and um, otoliths from the fish. This is an otolith, it's the ear stone, and when we break open their heads, this is what we're looking for. All right, next one. Once you preserve them, you get back to the lab. This is where you're generating your data. Today I've been cutting otoliths on the isomet saw to cut out the center section so that I can get the most material from the otolith. And then at that point, I'm gonna put it under the microscope which will give me the fish's true age. What's great about this job is what you see. It's being out here on the water and being able to see things, not just the snapper and the fish that we pull in. Um, you just never know, uh, besides what you're working on, what you're gonna see, um, whether it's on the line or off the line. Oh, oh, look at him, look at him, look at him. Look at, he's, he's after him. There's a big shark there. Oh, see, he's got him, he's got him. That's a black tip. The team also gathers information about sharks to share with other scientists. I'm taking some um, yeah. thin clips of the sharks for some of the species for um, Dean Grubbs at FSU. Whenever possible, they return the sharks to the Gulf. Got it. That was an outstanding haul. We got a lot of uh, red snapper. That'll give us a, uh, a number of things. Uh, first of all, a really good look at the contamination levels, the tissues, the blood, uh, but also we're trying to form the age composition of the population. So with so many red snapper, we can, we can see which ones are the threes, fours, fives, and six-year-olds and what level of abundance. So what we're gonna learn from this is basically what the levels of contamination are. Some of the fish are, are quite contaminated and they remain contaminated and they're, they're among the highest contaminated ever seen. Some of the other fish, uh, the, the contamination levels have dropped significantly, like red snapper, and you know that's a good thing. The problem comes in when you actually have exposure to toxic chemicals. It results in things like liver cancer and uh, uh, you know long-term genetic changes and, and other things that may affect the long-term viability of this population. Back on the weather bird, long lining for red snapper is over for the day and the mud team of the Mud and Blood crews has taken over the main deck. David Hollander and his researchers are launching a device that collects sediment samples from the seafloor. Uh, what we have here is the multi-core. Uh, this is a device for taking sediment cores from the ocean basin. Uh, it goes very deep. Uh, we can also take sh uh, cores in a much shallower environment like we are here. There's eight cores around a central column and this central core actually penetrates into the seafloor and then when we pick it up from the, with the winch, it actually closes both the caps on the upper and lower side. The team's investigation was motivated by the earlier and unexpected discovery that as much as 10% of Deepwater Horizon oil now covers vast areas of the sea floor. You got it? So why are we doing both sediment coring and fishing on the same cruise, which is sort of unorthodox? By us taking sediment cores in the same locations as we do the fishing, 
we're able to relate the evolution of the contaminants over time in the sediments to the changes that we see in the fish. It should take about 10 minutes to get down and about 10 minutes to get back. All right, we're in. What we're trying to do is track the vectors of contamination, how it goes from the sediments into the fish, and then how long it takes for the sediments to recover, the contamination to decrease, and see how that parallels the contamination in the fish. The core sampling operation was successful. Each of the core tubes is filled with sediment. Okay. So what we do now is remove the cores from the multi-core. We make a decision about what cores are going to be distributed to what scientific groups. This is a sediment core that we just collected, and it's a fresh core. And what we're gonna do right now, we're gonna split it in half so we can see inside, we can take pictures and have a record visually how the layers look in the sediment core. Inside each one of these tubes, uh, this is the best visual representation of what we get in each one. Just by seeing the changes in color, we can get a really good idea of how the, the uh, oxygen depletion uh, is occurring as you go down core. It also gives us a really good idea of when certain events happened in the core before we even date it or do any other further analyses. So just a visual inspection in any geology is really helpful. What this is essentially is a, a record of history or you could view it as a, a history book where you can peel back the layers or turn the pages back in the history of the Gulf of Mexico. So this could be anywhere from a couple of hundred years to present, each layer denoting a certain time the Deepwater Horizon is going to be the uppermost window of time uh, that is accumulated in this sediment core. This is very, very fine clay, very organic rich mud. We're going to analyze it for chemistry. When the weather bird returns to Panama City, all of the samples and data collected during the mud and blood cruise are carefully offloaded and brought to the University of South Florida in St. Petersburg. That's where the process of discovery continues. All right, y'all ready? Yep. This is the carbon dioxide uh, coming from the sample into the mass spectrometer. This is the reference gas for the nitrogen. Those are great pigs, actually. The chemical techniques that we use are essentially doing forensics on the events that are associated with the oil how the oil evolved in the system, and ultimately its impacts, its consequences, and its fate. Murawski and Hollander's team discovered that oil contamination transferred from tiny creatures that managed to survive in the oiled sediment to small fish that feed on those organisms. And then the contamination simply moved up the food chain until it reached larger fish, like the red snapper. But there was also some good news. The fish are fine. Um, Unless people are eating things like gallbladders, there should be absolutely no uh, difficulty in terms of um, meeting public health standards you know, for fish muscle, fish flesh. So people should be confident that they're not eating tented fish. Our focus now is the impacts of sedimentary oil. And that was surely a discovery uh, that was unexpected. It was one of the unexpected consequences uh, of the blowout. Today, the scientific community is working together to push the boundaries of what we need to know about oil spills and what we still need to discover. Yet in the end, there are simply no easy answers, no quick fixes. As exploration moves further offshore to deeper environments, these deep sea blowouts or any subsurface blowout of an oil well is the new breed of oil spills. What we're finding is that in many cases, those wells are gonna be over two miles deep. 
Much of that uh, deep water area re remains totally unexplored. There are many new species to be discovered. It's really on us to try to do as much as we can to try to understand and protect those animals that are likely to be highly vulnerable to these kinds of issues. In a world that is 70% ocean and interconnected by an increasing demand for energy, we cannot ignore the reality that the search for oil is a major economic issue of the 21st century. This presents the scientific community with an enormous challenge. To help find the right balance between the search for new sources of energy and what nature can safely provide. Though separated by distance and culture, for the more than seven billion people who draw sustenance from the resources of the world, there are common bonds. Bonds that are renewed by each generation, bringing new ideas, new attitudes, new hope. Planet Earth, this is our home. This is where our journey of discovery must begin.